I think the rate of expansion right now is, uh, you know, quite the game changer that, you know, we're just blowing things up right now. And the one of the points that I made online was that, you know, two points make a line that we doubled the expansion rate of, or, you know, the geofence area in three weeks from launch. And that tells you that this general solution that they have created is much easier and faster to scale than what Waymo has. Now, you know, it's two points. So like I said, we only have a line. You don't know, is it an actual line or is this a curve? Like, are we going to, are they going to double the geofence every three weeks? Or are they just going to add, you know, the same area roughly every three weeks? Or, you know, is it going to change? What's it, what's that going to look like? Uh, I think we're going to get a lot more information about that over the next month. Like I would be shocked at this point in time if we don't see Kyle, Texas included in the service coverage area. And then if we have Kyle, like where else the heck do we have? My guess is that we do go out and include the Gigafactory. Um, Although, you know, obviously you would think that they would want to be able to offer this service to all of their employees who work at the Mm -hmm. Tesla Gigafactory. Um, I know that they already offer it to some of their employees. So the question is, you know, where, where do all of the employees live and what's the difficulty in being able to include, you know, 80 or 90% of the Gigafactory employees in the coverage area? You know, cause that's a, a huge deal. It, it's not exactly cheap, you know, to live near where the factory is and, while, you know, Tesla is pretty generous on its stock option program and people can end up being compensated extremely well who are just normal everyday factory employees, that compensation isn't really, you know, just in the form of their take home salary, which makes it then hard to cover expenses. And so anyways, all, all that to say that if they can offer free or even cheap robo taxi transportation to and from work for these people that are having to travel back and forth 30 45 an hour an hour and a half um into the the factory and they can get that time where they don't have to pay attention they don't have to drive they don't have to deal with the traffic all of those things and they're you know running like i think you know this is one of the reasons why the robo van is something that they will want to get running sooner rather than later um, it's because it makes so much sense for this type of application. But yeah, like that's a, a huge perk for people that are having to do that. And, you know, the Gigafactory is just one place where people work in Austin who are all having to deal with that exact dynamic. Like if you could sign up for a membership to the Tesla Robo Taxi platform that got you to and from work every day for 20 bucks. And, you know, you have long commutes or whatever, and you get all that time back, like, that is so worth it. Um, And yeah, like Tesla can offer that service to its employees potentially for free as a perk. Um, But for anyone who lives in the Austin area who's got to deal with that, like, that's a a huge deal and a huge economic, um, it's a win for, you know, pretty much everyone involved all the way around. So, like, I think we're, we're pretty much there. We're ready for... Like the technology, the foundation of what they have built is yeah. built for that. It's very, very um, near. The question is just how long do they want to continue to play it safe? And I think it's going to be a difficult situation for you know Tesla to navigate philosophically because if you really want to maximize the good that you do for humans, it does require like tens of thousands of road deaths every year, right? Under the current regime. And obviously Tesla's going to get a ton of criticism and hate that first time that there's a fatality with a Tesla robo taxi that's involved regardless of whether that car is at fault or not, it could be, you know, someone else. Um, But it's going like the headlines are going to go out as soon as it happens that it was Tesla's fault, even if it wasn't. And then, you know, we'll get the investigation and everything will come out over time. But 
everyone will have moved on and it'll you know be stuck in a lot of people's minds that it was the the car's fault but that said you know that thing is going to happen at some point and if we try and delay it too much there's a lot of people that actually end up dying because they were riding around in human driven vehicles for longer and you know the we have the opportunity to reduce this death toll and it just is uh, a matter of having the organizational courage to weather that storm. So trying to figure out what what the timing is on all of that is a challenge that, you know, I think Tesla, the executive team, I'm sure they've talked about this at length and extensively. Like, when do we when do we make the decision to go ahead and expand knowing that, you know, if you're driving millions of miles every week or every month or, you know, whatever it is um, at that point in time that there's basically an unavoidable accident rate at that level of scale. And Waymo already, you know, they have hundreds of accidents every year. Um, I don't know that there's been any fatalities um, and most of them are not Waymo's fault and no one knows, no one cares. Um, They just think, you know, hey, it's working, it's fine. But that's just not going to be the case for Tesla. So, <clears throat> yeah, that's the you know those are the things that I'm I'm thinking about, um, because you know after experiencing the car, I'm like, this is ready as far as I can tell. the The way that it feels, the smoothness that it drives with, the planning horizon is excellent. Everything is dialed in. Um, you know, there's. Some more work to be done around pickup and drop offs, but you know that's not a huge surprise. Uh, it's already good. They can be a little bit better. It obviously will get better, and it will get better rapidly. Uh, you know they've already f- fixed a number of the things that people complained about with the app, and it's just gonna you know it's going to expand rapidly. So really, you know, like the the core thing that if we had the ability to see it that I would want to see is just what's the number of paid miles, like cumulative paid miles. And I would like to see that chart and I want to see it, you know, it's going to start out here and then it's going to tick up and it's going to tick up and it's going to tick up. Um, But I don't think they're going to give us that. So we just basically have to go off of secondary data points. And the best one that we have obviously is the coverage area. Um, Beyond that, if we can get some sort of a sense of how many cars there are, like cars and Square miles covered are good proxies for how many miles they're going to be yeah. uh, adding to the system. And then, you know, I think it'll be interesting to see what they do with their safety monitors. Do they, you know, roll out safety monitors in each location that they're expanding to? Um, or do they just keep them until they've got like a million miles under their belt? And then as soon as they you know, past the million mile belt, then just all safety monitors everywhere pretty much go away. Um, that'll be the other, the other data point. Um, but yeah, like as far as we can see, they're rapidly expanding the service area. We assume they have to be expanding the fleet. I know we haven't gotten confirmation of that. Hasn't that happened yet. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, it's all pointing in the right direction at this point. Yeah, I agree. I agree with with basically everything you said. I think the the ecosystem piece is is an interesting one. You know, with the bus or whatever the hell you want to call the toaster, the toaster, call mm-hmm. it the toaster, the avant garde toaster <laughs> or whatever. The robo toaster. Yeah, the robo toaster uh, or robovin. Um, so so that's very interesting. So if you start, you know, like if I, I was thinking about this with like the conversation around AI too, like Grok implementing Grok into the vehicles, it just opens up. It like makes the future a lot more clear. If you really think through it, Bef- before I mention that, I want to I want to sort of talk through the Kyle piece a little bit and the factory one because if they expand to Kyle, by default that means they're going to do highway because there's no way in hell you're going to get down to Kyle without taking 35. It's going to take you forever, right? So because the the suburban and suburban roads are going to are going to take forever. You're going to go through a lot of like slow roads. 35 will get you there in like 30 minutes. If you don't take 35, even even with traffic, it'll get you down there 45, 50. On a, on a regular traffic day, if you don't take 35, it'll take you an hour plus at least to get down to Kyle. So I, I think the Kyle expansion 
goes hand in hand with the highway, opening up highways. And if they do expand to Kyle in the next three weeks to say a couple months or whatever, end of the year, then by default, they're going to open up the highways. And with the highways opening up, you're all of a sudden also opening up access to the factory. Because the factory, access to in and out of the factory, if you look at the map on Google, uh, you, you, there are pathways to connect Austin and the factory without taking the highway, but it, it's, again, a Kyle situation. It's not that far away from the city, but it's far enough where taking a highway makes too Like, you have to take the highway to get there. And, and if you do Austin. highways, then you're already doing things that Waymo doesn't do. In Austin. I believe they take highways in L.A., if, if, uh, if I'm not mistaken. But, but then, all, yeah, but exactly. So the highway, is, the highway piece is what connects your your suburban rural are areas to your urban centers. And that's when you start going to your San Marcos and your Waco and your Bertrams and your Bastrops, right? And then all the way up to Dallas and San Antonio. And maybe you, you could link it all the way down to Houston, right? And, and you kind of go that, that route. So, um, so those two go hand in hand. The ecosystem piece with the, uh, with the toaster, the RoboVan and sort of like talking about the, the Tesla membership for transportation. You know, I think, I think the pathway for, for a company like Tesla to get to a point where transportation, it's like transportation as a service kind of thing, is becoming very clear and obvious. So it's like this, it's going to become this app model where it doesn't matter where you are, you're going to have access to a, a robo-taxi. In what, like in the United States in the next five years' time, it doesn't matter where you are, you're going to have access to the RoboTaxi app, and you might have a membership that say, pay 50 bucks a month, you get to ride a RoboTaxi for free, whatever, like whatever the number is, right? 100 bucks a month. And it doesn't matter where you are, you hail the RoboTaxi, gets you from place to place. It, you can even take a cross-country trip if you really wanted to, and they're going to have an ecosystem that's going to be smart enough to know that, hey, okay, this person's trying to go from New York to L.A., I should probably use the longest range vehicles I have in my, in my fleet. I'm going to start allocating it to this trip. And then for each supercharger stop, right, I'm going to give the person maybe like a 30-minute like a layover time where I'm not going to charge it for idling fees. And during those 30 minutes, they can either choose to jump into another car. They can choose, right? Have a car ready for me so that I can lay over really fast. I can just grab my bag and throw it in the other one and keep going. Or, hey, I'm going to pause for 30 minutes. I'm going to take my a lot of 30-minute time. Maybe you get a 10% discount for that leg or something. You can use, it to use the bathroom. You can grab some food. And then the car just charges itself. And then you can use the same car to go down, right? And then so there are ways to make the ecosystem work for, for Tesla to offer super long distances with RoboTaxi. But then that, that is like the – I don't know how big of a use case that's going to be. 90% plus of the miles are going to be, you know, intra-city – Intra-metro area, right? So it's going to be like suburban to to urban, or even rural to to urban, and then uh, back and forth in those areas. So, um, it, and, and so okay. So with the integration of Grok in their vehicles, right? You can you can start to see that Tesla wants to create this ecosystem for a product that's deeply integrated with artificial intelligence. But what what that's ma really made me think through is like, okay, so if you're going to have this ecosystem. And Grok is going to be integrated in that ecosystem. And Grok is going to remember memory in Grok on just the Grok.com. So if you do a query, it just remembers what you've queried. So it's like, oh, I remember based on what you've said before, based on this, then it could, you know, it could be helpful to you know, do this and blah, blah, blah. And you're down, going down the right path or whatever. It's going to be really annoying to have a car that remembers who you are. But then you go on your phone and then phone doesn't remember you from the car and vice versa, right? So if we're going to be people, if we're going to be a species that's going to use transportation to go from place to place, does this mean that Tesla then is just laying out the groundwork for this in-between device that's going to remember you in between you taking their cars, in between you taking the bus and the robo-van, in between you using the Musk universe of products? If you take a rocket to Mars, which is going to be integrated with Grok, you know, is, anyway, I'm, I'm kind of going off the rails a little bit, but I, it does open up this discussion around like the Musk ecosystem. Like it's becoming obvious that Grok well, is going to be an integral part to the whole thing and how he's building Tesla and all the other companies. 
Yeah, I think that context piece that you're talking about, that is a challenge, not just for Elon and XAI and Tesla, um, but really all of the model providers. Like, you do want to have memory. And I know all, you know, all these ecosystems are going to want to offer you, you know, like vertically integrated memory that is within their own walled garden. But I, I think there's a huge opportunity for a player to come along and provide you with your personal context, your personal memory, that then you can set permissions for that um, so that it can be consumed by any different model that you're using. Um, and so that it's persistent, that you know you can have a conversation with your Grok model um, and the contents of the conversation are captured by your personal memory thing. And then you can have another conversation with a different model at a different point in time and ask it about that same memory and, um, and it can provide it to you, which I think is a very interesting move that perplexity just made, you know, going into having their own browser, because you can think of like that browser, <clears throat> if you use that browser and you're not jumping off to all of the different apps, then that browser is a persistent interface for you. Now it's going to be really hard for perplexity to get the type of distribution so that everyone's using their browser everywhere all the time. Um, so that is a challenge, but like from a theoretical standpoint that if the Comet browser or something like the Comet browser can be at that point of interface between you and all of your internet browsing activity and all of your model usage activity, then it can capture all of that, that context and that data for you. Um, it's, yeah, I don't know who's, you know, who the players are going to be that really execute on that concept, uh, first, but I, I think that is one of the big opportunities, you know, that's available as we are going to be rewriting, you know, the whole foundational architecture of, you know, how people interact with technology.